بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم اینڈ اے ویری گڈ ڈے ٹو آل آف یو مائی ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس آئی ہوپ دیٹ یو آر ویل اے ویری وارم ویلکم ٹو لیکچر نمبر تھرٹی ون آف رپورٹ رائٹنگ اسکلس ان دس لیکچر وی آر گوئنگ ٹو اسٹارٹ فرام ویئر وی لیفٹ ان دا پریویس لیکچر یو آر ویل اویئر آف آل دا ڈیٹیلس دیٹ آئی پرووائڈیڈ یو ود ان دا پریویس لیکچر اینڈ آئی ٹولڈ یو دیٹ the previous lecture and the one that we are going to study, that we are going to simply go through in our today's session, it is all about what we have covered throughout this course of report writing skills with reference to what we have covered within the last lecture. So of course, we tried to cover the first part, dividing, of course, the whole content into two parts, two equal parts, and we simply covered technical communication, then talking about report itself in detail, its structure, then giving you all the awareness of the writing process itself and the way you can simply make it more better by applying the seven C's of communication. And then of course we move towards uh, the actual forms of writing, the way they exist within our professional life, the way we have to communicate, the way we have to use our writing skills to come up with different forms of writing and this shall be the focus in our today's session so let us begin by starting from a memorandum the way we started it let's just have a quick overview of all the components that we studied so if I talk about memorandum itself memory and memorandum quite interrelated so it will be quite easy for you to understand that it's all about bringing something to remembrance as a reminder or to make you remember something. So it's of course a type of an informal report used for intra-office and inter-office communication. It's of course brief and simple and in case it is detailed then you of course provide it in the form of an attachment. Without any formal salutation and closing remarks. Why? Because it is there within an office is basically an interaction which is taking place between different departments or different personnel working within the same conditions which is why no need of such a formal salutation and closing remarks the way you have them when you have to interact with someone that you don't know and moving ahead you basically avoid personal statements because it's happening in a formal environment which is why you basically avoid such personal statements to avoid that personal touch within your writing you move ahead and the purpose of writing a memorandum is to include relaying of information persuasion and it can be feedback it's also used for motivating the employees by coming up with some good news that you want to deliver them so that's the purpose of a memorandum as well. It's also used for building some good relationship and establishing accountability by uh, putting things in written. And then it's also used for issuing a directive. So it's quick, it's informal and informal doesn't mean the informal use of language, but the element of formality is that you keep it short and short is basically the content that you simply uh, communicate or use to deliver and transmit information between and people working in an office. So this is basically the reason why it's called as the informal report because it's short and it's used in a very short environment, an office or different departments of an office. Now if we move ahead, the qualities of a good memorandum just the way we studied them so a good memorandum grabs the reader's attention makes some recommendation and asks for some action and explains benefits to the readers as well these are the components that we talked about within the structure of a memorandum in case of your co-workers and colleagues you have to focus on the main point because they know each and everything. Once again, focus on the same point. No need of that formality, the opening statements and closing remarks. Just get to the point. 
and you can provide details if your audience is from a separate department because they do not know you to that extent as your friends and your colleagues can. With respect to the structure, there should be a clear subject line, purpose stated within the first paragraph using some bulleted and number list to request an action, provide charts and graphs at the end as well. So if it's needed and to make things more clear and making it a more accessible document design, then of course you can also use these charts and graphs as well at the end to make it more effective communication. When we talked about the different types of memorandums, so we talked about the information memo where the purpose is all about the transfer of information. If there is a problem for which you are required to provide some sort of solution, then you simply go for the problem solving memo structure. And if the purpose is to persuade someone for an action or for a decision to be taken, then you start of course from some points on which you agree with your audience and then you move ahead to the call to the action that what action is basically required and this kind of memo is the persuasion memo in case of some suggestions that you really like to propose to the senior management you basically structure your memo in the form of the internal memorandum proposal and if this memorandum is all about stating a policy or some procedure that you want your readers to follow, your audience or the immediate readers, receivers of your information, then such a memorandum which is stating a policy is known as the directive memo. In case of your uh, audience, when it is expected by you that your audience is going to provide you a response, so of course you write a memo and then you expect uh, from them to provide you some sort of feedback as well. So that memo which will be written by your audience is basically considered to be a response to an inquiry memo. Providing audience the desired kind of information which they were asking for. If my audience was my boss and he simply wrote a memorandum or some instruction towards me and now he or she expects from me to write a memorandum providing some feedback on the stated problem then I'm going to provide this feedback in the form of the response to an inquiry memorandum. Field report memo was also discussed in detail written after an employee returns from a business venture. So the purpose here is that they were on a venture, they were on this visit and after that visit now they have to report everything which they have observed. So for this purpose, they write this field report memo because this memo covers everything which they have observed within that field and they have to report it. Whereas if we talk about the trip report memo, this basically type of memorandum has this other name as well of lab report memo where it is expected from you to go through this actual process of observation, analysis, data collection and then coming up with some results. So over here you have to report on an inspection that you have gone through, that you have seen, that you have observed, that you have been part of and now you have to report it. So for that you basically use the format of a trip report or a lab report memorandum. You talk about the formatting and the structuring of this memorandum. So with respect to the format, one inch page margins on all sides, all lines beginning from left, single spaced lines, there should be single spacing between the lines of a paragraph, whereas in case of starting up a new paragraph, then you have to click on the enter button twice, meaning double space. And you all simply begin this memorandum structure in this form where you have to write to, which means who is your addressee from who is your addresser, then the date on which it is being sent or written, and then the subject matter. With respect to the subject matter, I remember I told you in detail that your subject should have two basic components, this focus and the topic. As the example clearly tells you, the salary increase for the accountants over here, clearly mentioned subject is there, 
where the focus is your accountants and the topic is the salary increase what actually happened and uh, for what this salary increase is there so over here you have a clear division of the focus and the topic in this way you have to state the subject as clearly mentioned and discussed in detail within the lecture of the memorandum itself then after mentioning all these lines you move ahead to write an introduction where you state your purpose defining the subject then you go towards the discussion section where you provide some necessary explanation moving ahead towards the analysis section where you just talked about the methodology chosen on the basis of that methodology and its application what were the results you simply provide them in the form of a numerical data and on the basis of which you conclude and move towards a call to action and at the end once again as i talked in the beginning of this structuring no complimentary closing is required when it comes to the structuring of a memorandum then what you have to actually mention what you have to actually cover within the structure it's the distribution list to whom you have to distribute a copy of such memorandum if there is anything to be attached you also mention it over here and then attach it as well alongside the memorandum and then you move towards the copies to whom a copy has to be provided or has to be sent so basically if you have to say it all within a single bullet you need a clear opening providing some detail then summarizing all the points concluding them and then indicating this call to action is the structure of a memorandum then we moved ahead towards the next category of writing or i would call it as the structured form of writing because that is going to be the focus of course we're going to look towards the other category of this letter writing as well because it has these categories formal and informal but to begin let's take a start this form of writing which is used to communicate with people at distance this was the actual purpose when letter came into existence or when it was uh, developed as a genre or as a form of writing to be used for communication a record of information discussing matter of common concern and maintaining good relation this turned out to be the purpose when we talked about uh, i'm talking with reference to the last one maintaining some good relation the way we simply write the informal letters but when it comes to formal there is much more to do as well the purpose includes job application some inquiries some complaints which you have to make the business transaction now this is the category of the formal letter writing so we're going to look into it but these are some of the purposes it's a permanent physical record free from malwares so this is uh, basically the advantage that you get even by the use of letter writing nowadays because with reference to the way you have studied email writing so there is much more which can be a bit risky deletion of content it's um, the files can get corrupt they can be deleted they can be misplaced they can be um, deleted by an accident so many things can happen but a permanent physical record can exist when it comes to this letter writing now the types as i mentioned divided into informal and formal letters the informal more related to family and friends whereas the formal letter writing is more oriented towards your professional communication that you do within an official environment now talking about its structure with reference to the informal one the one which you use with your family with your friends your relatives how do you begin you need a heading where you have to provide details of uh, the sender's address for example if you are the one who is basically writing the letter so you have to provide your details at the beginning and it will be the heading or the sender's address you move ahead and start with the salutation and then followed by name of your friend for example if i am writing a letter to a friend dear ahmed and in this way then i'm going to place a comma then my main body is going to come where i'm going to start with some introduction i'll move ahead to provide some details in the form of body and then i'm going to conclude and it's all written in a conversational manner this is what makes it an informal mode of writing where you can be a bit frank rise and fall everything at the end you're going to move towards the section of subscription where you write yours affectionately 
or yours sincerely. Minor difference with reference to when you are writing to your family members. So you try to be more affectionate and in a similar way you write it or you express that same affection in your letter by saying yours affectionately. Whereas with your friends you try to be sincere with them and in this case you have to write it yours sincerely. And you can also do uh, with reference to writing to your family once again the third form which is your affectionate son your affectionate daughter now see and remember this difference over here the s is missing so don't write yours affectionate son because that will be incorrect so mind it and remember it as well then if there is anything else which should be other than the script itself you're going to write it in ps which means postscript and then all the additional information which comes after signing off and this another abbreviation which is also used you have seen it quite often you are well aware of it and this is all about extending invitation for a response so if you want the other person to respond although they will respond if it's required but if you really want to indicate it so that's the way you do it within the informal letter RSVP. You move ahead and uh, look towards the formal letter format and structure. Minor difference but you have to remember it and observe it very carefully. Heading once again sender's address. But now comes the difference where you have to mention the inside address. And whose address is this? The one to whom you are basically sending the letter. So the receiver's information is going to come right after your own information. Address is detail. Right afterwards, heading inside address, you're going to once again uh, start with the salutation, with the greetings, dear sir, madam. And these are the expressions, of course, when you are not aware of to whom you're basically writing. So not aware of the name, dear sir, madam, that's all. But when you know their name, so the good way is do dear mister and then surname. I'm not saying the first name. The surname or the last name which comes at the end is written alongside uh, Mr. and Miss. Then your subject in a, within a single sentence. You have to mention it. Right afterwards the body within which you introduce your content, the purpose, then the main message which you have to write, provide a bit of detail and then you conclude it. That's the way you write the body. Right afterwards, you uh, simply move to subscription where you say yours faithfully for the unknown person and yours sincerely for the known person. So once again, just to make you remember, uh, for the unknown person, you just want them to have faith in you, which is why you write it and you communicate it indirectly by writing yours faithfully. Whereas you are already trying to be sincere with the people whom you know or they know you. So you can simply say you are sincerely or you are sincere friend just the way you try to be friends with your uh, neighborhood friends or classmates. So you write yours sincerely in a similar way. You try to do it over here as well just to bridge the gap. Just try to bring the interlocutor and the conversationalist people who are interacting together. Then the signature name and designation because this is the formal way of writing so you have to mention what you basically are what do you do as a profession then anything which you have to enclose that is that has to be mentioned alongside this encl and dot which means which refers to enclosure and to whom it has to be sent in the form of carbon carbon copy so alongside the cc and colon you have to mention the names and that is something which you have to do you move ahead to look to the different types of letter that we have seen, that we have studied. So the inquiry letter is the one I can state it. It's all about stating that we need to inquire about this thing. So asking someone for specific information is clear intent within introduction. It has to be mentioned. Then you have to mention all the needs within the discussion and then you have to uh, make a precise conclusion. So that is how you basically write an inquiry letter. Clear intent, a purpose with an introduction, what are the needs within discussion and a precise conclusion. When you have to make a complaint, a little bit of difference. 
to bring some mistakes into notice more or less related with these problems which are related to buyers and sellers selling and purchasing so it all begins with some facts which you have to mention at the beginning to make it all authentic then discussion on some problem which you have faced and then try to end it positively to maintain a relation if you really want your products to be returned back to you in a good form then try to maintain some good relationship we talk about cover letter we discussed in detail you will be needing it all the time and that's why it becomes very much important and that is the reason because of which it was taught to you a supplement to a resume because if this is your resume this is your cover letter and it will be placed over here and this is the importance that this letter has uh, with reference to whenever you will be applying for a job a supplement to a resume to express interest in a position and key resume points are always there within a cover letter and to make it a success you need some prior research and some whenever you have to write it first of all this research is going to help you what to write to attract the interest of your interviewer then you have to keep it brief alongside some you attitude uh, by the use of you attitude highlighting the fact that the interviewer or the person or the employer is going to get the benefit from you by your services so this you you will be getting all the benefit as a result of all these qualifications that I have so these are the things which have to be stated within this cover letter how first state why you are writing then supporting evidence for your worth and once you simply prove yourself then you simply try to make space for an interview call so that is the way you structure the cover letter and you have seen all the examples we talk about the good news letter and as it says it's all about sharing a good news so you do it immediately or related with appreciation some motivation or sharing some good news so it all begins with stating the purpose and begin with the good news itself all of a sudden you simply state it right after the purpose and conclude with what you plan next because the other person would already be in a very good mood to listen to what you are planning next whereas in case of the bad newsletter that you are well aware of you know a bit tricky uh, because it's all about the rejection the denial and due to this bad news itself and its nature and the impact that it has on the other person the reader or the receiver it can't be stated directly which is why you need some tricks to do it you have to prepare the receiver to accept what is coming by you know coming up with some facts uh, making them realize that it was really tough for you to share this bad news itself but it has to be shared which is why you are sharing it but it comes afterwards so state the news in the middle and try to end with a, with a positive note to maintain a good relationship so you have to calm the other person down and that is how you simply uh, try to maintain this good relationship which also be although becomes quite tough when the bad news has been stated but you have to give it a try you have to put in your best efforts and that is how you can become a good writer if you can really write a good and efficient and effective bad newsletter itself email writing that letter transforms into the electronic version when you simply have an email ID you have a system you have the internet so you simply make an email account for yourself and then you are able to write emails so the electronic version of an email correspondence which is done through the internet these are the advantages as discussed it's quite cost effective quite convenient can be sent to anyone anywhere very quickly but some of the drawbacks when compared with the letter writings so of course letter has its own advantages this version has its own so everything has to be uh, acknowledged and appreciated because that's the reason they exist in our surroundings so it can be self-fulfilling can be one of the type then it can be more or less related to inquire about something just the way we had this inquiry letter so in a similar way it can be an inquiry email then it can be an open-ended dialogue and some action-based email where you really want to initiate an action 
In order to write it in an effective way, first determine the audience and what will be the desired outcome. Once you're aware of it, then you simply start writing and try to stick to facts and keep it brief and simple. And that is the way you are able to write it successfully. For some effective tips, uh, you have to pretend first that you are trying to have this face-to-face -face interaction because this pretending or imagining that you are uh, having this first face-to-face -face interaction is going to make you realize that this person is new to me and right now is there in front of me. So how to impress him, how to convince him if I really want to initiate an action, how should I do it? So you're going to start with a good impression. So you're going to introduce yourself in a very good way and then you'll come to the main point and then you will try to end with a good note so that the other person remembers you. So this has to be remembered here and it has to be applied. So talking about the prereqs, these are the things which I mentioned already. Uh, then when it comes to the structuring, it's divided into a head which comes at the top and then the body where you basically uh, greet then you provide the main text and then you close it all done with 60 to 70 characters per line this has to be remembered because this is with reference to the computer screen you know so this computer screen can simply display 60 to 70 characters per line in a conventional way this is these are the lines these are the characters which have been you know, calculated and which is why these are being provided to you so if your content is short it will be read easily talking about the smartphones when the emails are read over there so it can become even quite short compared to a screen so the purpose here of mentioning all these things is that try to keep it brief once again reference to seven C's of communication especially conciseness if it's clear if it's concise if it's concrete if it's clear if it's courteous the point here is you keep it short so it will be more effective 12, uh, 12 to 14 lines are visible on the screen. Afterwards, they are dragging it by either using a mouse or your thumb on a touch screen. So this can have a big impact. How do you basically write or compose it? It all begins with the identification line, just the way they were there in the previous forms of writing. Two, referring to uh, receiver. Uh, then the CC, carbon copy to home copies will be sent via email then BCC you know it refers to the blind carbon copy which means the person can view the email but no one else who is placed in two would know that uh, there is anyone who is also receiving because uh, that person who is there placed in the blind carbon copy is not visible to anyone who is there in two and CC and then you have to place the subject matter as well from is not there because you are the one writing so you, over there you do not have to mention it is auto automatically generated that the email is coming from this email id with your name so from doesn't come over here within the identification lines subject has to be focused clear and informative you got the examples then you basically greet by starting with dear then the individual surname and if mentioned if you are not aware of the surname then you simply write the designation so that can be done as well there are, if there are teachers so you can simply say sir madam if they are at a administrative position uh, their manager respected director so that's the way you basically do it then you move ahead with the opening sentence which provides a reason for writing uh, a link with the ongoing communication it can be because if the communication is already taking place between you and the other person so this is with reference to the ongoing conversation that we had uh, related to the topic which becomes your subject matter so then you move ahead with providing some supporting details you close uh, the discussion with the closing sentence which paves the way for a feedback and the call to action then you end it all by some appreciation with a thank you note and at the end the subscription you are now aware of it you sign off by saying sincerely or a thank you or best regards and some other ways that you have studied as well then comes the addressers information this is the point where you can really provide the details at the end not the from 
that from category is not here that is there within the memorandum but with reference to the email this is the place where you can write all the details that you want to mention and at the end if there is any attachment to be placed you're going to um, attach the file it can be a PDF it can be a word document it can be any other file but the point here is you add the attachments as well and they are clearly mentioned highlighted within the email as well they're clearly visible and they can be downloaded as well so these are the components when we talk about the email there are other components which we discussed while uh, referring to and talking about uh, the email writing and that's spamming and flaming what is spamming of course the practice of sending some auto generated emails so it's not accepted it's its auto generated version is basically like a virus it can simply be misused to collect and get your personal information which is why you have to be well aware of it it's often fake and used to collect your information and care is always needed while giving an open access to personal email address or it may be used to send spam emails without your consent because once it's there on www then it can be used, misused, and even abused, which is why you have to be well aware of it. You have to be cautious, maintaining a folder where you have to simply put all these spam emails aside from the, all the major emails which are re relevant to you. Talking about the second category of flaming, so it's all about the emotional exchange of words which may harm and affect these social relationship, and the only way to avoid it is to keep it aside. If it's trying to come towards you, all these flaming, put it aside, delete it, try to avoid it, because if you start doing it, it will increase. So it happens because of the interaction, and it can be avoided if you put an end to that interaction. So it can be avoided. Now talking about the presentation skills which are very much important we discussed them due to the same reason in quite much detail and talking about them once again all about the means of communication to convey your thoughts your ideas adapted to speaking situations so it is something that if you develop and I'm sure you will develop you will become very good at these skills you're going to simply be like a star because this presentation is always required if you have these skills you can talk in class you can talk on stage you can discuss anything uh, in some debates in some discussion in a round table where your opinions are needed but if you know how to present something or to present your own opinion you won't have any problem you will never be shy you will never hesitate so which is why these were discussed in quite much detail and to talk about them once again used for briefing a team, addressing a meeting, talking to a group, making a speech, getting points across a video conference. These are the different modes with technology. It has evolved, but you should adapt yourself to be aware and to accept every different form of the presentation itself, which is why you are made to do it yourself too. The purpose includes information, education, persuasion, and the key elements of a presentation were also uh, discussed with you. There is always a context and you have to be well aware of it. Then the presenter itself, uh, carrying out your own SWOT analysis, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what, the, what are the opportunities which are there for you and what are the threats that you have to deal with. Moving ahead, what is the nature of my audience, then uh, what basically you have to do in order to make it a success, what delivery method has to be there, uh, whether it should be an oral presentation or some Skype presentation, video conference session, how should it be? And then what are the barriers which may harm your presentation? So you have to be well aware of all these elements of a presentation. How do you develop a presentation? It's basically a three-stage process, which is uh, all about creation, preparation, and then presentation. So these are the things discussed, anxiety and fear, one fear about future and one fear about present so that's how they are uh, discriminated but the point here is go through the three ta uh, three stage process and that will make it a piece of cake by starting with the creation where you simply select a topic you set some objectives you start doing research you analyze the audience once again 
demographics and the knowledge then you move ahead to create an outline then select and insert some content within the presentation tool which you have chosen then you prepare some additional material which can be the handouts some sheets some cards if you really want to share them with the audience if some, there is some chart you can simply think of anything while um, using this powerpoint presentation if that is the presentation tool which you are using so you try to uh, simply write few words within each bullet then avoiding some excessive use of bullets that has to be there within your mind as well because that'll, uh, that'll look like that it's all filled up with some bullets with which you are trying to attack the audience so you have to keep it brief then you have to keep in mind that discussion that we had regarding uh, this contrast, the color contrast which should be there between your uh, text color and the background color of the screen just the way over here the background is white where the color is dark or the black and that's why it becomes more visible and there was another one that I talked about it was all about the white text with a dark background but that, the environment, the situation was totally different Generally, by convention, this is the format which is followed and that's why it's always recommended even over here to follow the same kind of format the way it's present in front of you. Talking about the pre preparation, uh, within this phase of preparation, you basically do all the rehearsal with that content which you have prepared. Then you take some good rest. Then you simply dress up properly by the dressing, you know what dressing means, how you can dress formally to have an effect on the audience. The dress is going to speak for your mood the way you are and the way you're going to present. And of course, to make sure that you reach in time, you try to arrive early. Then talking about the presentation itself, you begin with an attention getter. These were the techniques to catch the attention of your audience. They were of different forms. You can think of any one of them to apply it within your own presentation. It can be a short, a relevant story, an anecdote. Then you move ahead. You can simply give them uh, an analogy. Good writing is like a good design. And that means that the if the design is attractive, the audience is going to simply appreciate it. In a similar way, if uh, your writing is good, the audience is going to appreciate it and understand it and interpret it. So, one analogy. Gimmick a trick that you can simply do. Some people just simply light up a cigarette and then look at the audience and say, yeah, what? And if the person is here to talk about this, uh, the effects or the harmful effects of smoking and all of a sudden lights up a cigarette, don't you mean the audience is going to simply look at him and say, why is he doing this thing? But the purpose was to catch their attention so that they may start looking at him or her and say, why is he simply trying to do this thing when he is there to talk against it? So it was a gimmick, which is why it was performed. Then you can come up with some humor as well, some relevant joke, some relevant question and some really startling statistics. So you can think of all these things and that can play a big role especially at the beginning of a presentation now going through the presentation process you introduce yourself you talk about the title what's your basic agenda within the presentation you start on time you are the whole time confident about everything that you are saying you are uh, simply standing straight you are erect you know what you are saying and you are confident about it you maintain eye contact and you change it as well, not just sticking to a single individual, but you move around, you look at everyone, you try to involve them and keep some main points and some key words reminder to maintain this conversational flow. Purpose is that you may forget. Sometimes they may ask some question as a result of which while answering the question, you may forget what you were talking about. So you need to have some key points with you and that is going to help you. Use the presentation tool itself as a guide and variety to supplement your own skills but not just totally rely on if there is some presentation or if there is some presentation around me and I am on this central left side. I am not, I'm not just totally relying on the presentation itself. I talk to you. I speak to you on my own as well. But I just return back 
so that I may not I may not miss out anything. Right now, I'm trying to rely more comparatively more compared to my previous lectures because I want to keep unity with everything which I have taught within the previous lecture and this one which is revising all those components. So comparatively I'm trying to be a bit more reliable towards uh, the points which are there within the slides but you will have the space that even if you write few bullet points you can talk to the audience right now the audience you are well aware of it is my camp through which I'm able to reach you. So that's the difference. This is the point which is why it has been made red that let's suppose you have to talk about any topic and you have simply written paragraphs over it. It's quite easy to read from the slides but that is not going to involve your audience because they'll simply think in mind why is this person standing when we can also view and read all the slides by our own. Your purpose is to talk over here and that slide all those points are there just to help you out, just to give you this clue of what to talk about in your next few minutes. That is the purpose and you have to keep that in mind. In case of this PowerPoint presentation, once again, a quick recap. Few slides, few bullet points and contrast between your text and the background. You can use gestures and pitch to involve the audience. This rise and fall of the tone is going to involve them a lot within your uh, presentation because they're going to simply say this person is quite interactive and knows what he or she is talking about and that is going to help you a lot when you are presenting in front of the audience. So uh, with respect to the strategies you talked about nonverbal and paraverbal communication. Nonverbal mean these gestures and the paraverbal is the rise and fall the vocal communication through which you basically emphasize on something, you stress on something, so this is the paraverbal communication. And there could be anything which may happen during your presentation. For example, load shading or some sudden power outage, some um, you know, sudden breakdown of electricity because of which uh, lights are out, there is no alternate, the systems are all shut down, what to do. So even if they get some light, if they just simply open up some curtains, they open up some doors, as a result of which some light is entering the room, you may have some handouts. And through those handouts, if you circulate them, even if that is not possible, you must have a handout for yourself so that you may continue with the talk that you are proceeding with. And another plan could be that you start taking the opinion of the audience as well. They'll have so many things to talk about. So if there is a sudden blackout, why not involve the audience to take their feedback over it till the time it's all settled down. So you can think of and should have a contingency plan over here. This is the purpose of mentioning here. So with respect to the verbal and non-verbal communication strategies, what you can do is while getting uh, feedback, you need to listen from your audience and of course you need to read as well before the presentation because this reading is going to help you for gaining knowledge and once you have the knowledge you'll be able to express it before the audience. So this listening and reading enhances your knowledge and another tip of being effective presenter is that when the audience is speaking, when they are talking you have to nod, you have to uh, listen to them very carefully because that is going to make them realize that this person really wants to get our feedback and really much is involved with the overall talk which is happening within the room. So be honest and convey more with less words, a big technique which involves once again the use of seven C's of communication. You need to involve the audience by doing this you attitude and keeping your language quite gender neutral. Using such words which end not with man but with person. For example, uh, once again chairman and chairperson. So there, there's a big difference between the two and whenever you have to use one, how about chairperson? So such words are more applicable in such environment as well. Another useful tip, two to three minutes on each slide. Gain attention and greet your audience. Create a desire with an effective opening and signposting. Signposting means I'm going to start with this, then I'll move with this, and lastly I'll come to this. 
this first moving onwards then finally lastly at the end is signposting you guide them just the way you guide people on the road this is this road goes to this area then it goes to this area this is signposting and then you end your talk to stimulate an action which is basically the purpose of almost each and every communication talking with uh, talking about the dressing is going to speak as well so you need to have some well pressed dressing some good hair and clean shoes shiny shoes and a good eye contact as well with your audience then no repetitive sighing I talked about it this is basically the sign don't do it again again and again because it's going to make your audience feel this person is quite tired if I even start doing it again and again you'll get bored as well just the way you do quite often even without listening so moving ahead only pertinent pauses were needed so when you have to move to the next point of course you can take a pause just the way I did moving ahead if you have raised a question now audience has to think you can take a pause so these are the pertinent pauses do not just stop while speaking because once again it's going to affect your overall flow of communication active nodding while listening and no finger pointing this is totally cross not required do not point fingers because even right now you will feel like I'm pointing towards you uh, you'll forget everything that I'm saying and instead you're just going to remember the teacher was just pointing fingers at me so it has to be avoided try to involve them by such gestures as I told you earlier and alongside when you are listening to the other person okay oh, yes you are very right this is the way in which you basically actively nod to the person's talk we talked about this topic as well you know how important this one we discussed it in detail because this copy pasting is always happening which is why it's there at the top you just control C control V and everything is all ready and you just simply submit it to the teacher and say yes sir, we have done it yes ma'am we have done it but why are marks not that good what's the reason ma'am what's the reason sir can you tell us what's the reason so this is the reason because of which you basically lose your marks you steal the identity, language, thought, ideas and expression of another individual and then claim it to be your own. Then how can we expect to get the marks? That's not the way. You're not acknowledging the source. And if it's intentional, it will affect your academic standing as well as your professional life, which is why it was taught there and I am speaking once again. Cite the source to avoid plagiarism by placing the quote either in text in text form or in a block form within the center when, where it is indented and separate from the rest of the paragraph using the quotation marks and the standard document uh, documentation style APA, MLA and Chicago just the way we learn them facts which are not that common comments, opinion and interpretation about facts are all documented because common things do not require such kind of citation and referencing and acknowledging because everyone know it so moving ahead you basically cite together the content of a single paragraph this is basically the tip and separately for a widely separated parts of a work so if you are taking two references from a paragraph cite them together whereas this is the source one book taking references from different chapters cite them separately insert your own comments if you have to within uh, this reference using the square black so if there is a reference that you are basically uh, adding into your content and then you have to insert your own comments so those comments have to be inserted within square brackets and that is how they will be identified to be your own comments what else can you do? You paraphrase to condense the original version of a text with an original articulation of the other author's idea. So that's how you basically paraphrase. You do not miss it. You uh, credit the original author as well within the paraphrasing as well. Which means paraphrasing doesn't mean that if you have simply rephrased everything, it's your own. No, you have to once again give credit to the author as well. You have to acknowledge him or her. Synonyms is not the solution to a paraphrasing a text. Instead, what you can do is read that content, then cover it. Then try to rewrite what you have learned from it and then open it and then compare the two together. 
and where you find the similarities of wording you can put it aside and then what you get is something that you acknowledge uh, alongside the source so you basically uh, state it in the form of a paraphrased version and alongside you acknowledge the source in case of the copyrights we talked about it you know the legally stated list of rights that an author gets in that case you have to really seek a permission because it's no longer a moral issue but it becomes a legal issue if you are simply uh, committing this act of plagiarism copy pasting that component which has copyrights so you cannot cite it without a written permission and other examples of some plagiarism include copying the outline if some other person has made an outline which they have used within their work and now you have to write anything of your own but still if you are taking their outline this becomes plagiarism as well collusion of course one person working whereas for the credit there are so many people who are saying you have to mention our name as well because we need to you know uh, move ahead and get some rise in each and everything getting all sorts of benefits and for that purpose if your uh, na different people's names are being incorporated who have not contributed so they are basically doing this collusion moving ahead false citation a is basically the individual who has written something whereas the content remains the same whereas within this bracketing within the reference basically the name of B is mentioned so this becomes a false citation and this also is an example of plagiarism because A actually wrote it whereas B is being acknowledged so this becomes plagiarism as well and then A has written something and now it has to be published and now that same component is being submitted by changing its form into other uh, forums as well where it can be republished as well so this multiple submissions of a work for getting different publications become a plagiarism act as well and has to be avoided too so these are the categories about which people simply let it go they do not pay heed to it but these are all sensitive and very serious issues and have to be avoided by all means so how do you basically try to avoid uh, plagiarism you need to be aware of the referencing style you basically cite the document uh, and you simply document the original source and to enhance the credibility of your research this is the advantage that you get you are citing something which means that it's quite authentic why you are citing original works of the other people as well which means you're reading and on the basis of your reading you're enhancing knowledge and then trying to put it all in your own work so it makes it more credible you cite exact words you need phrases ideas diagrams illustrations so these are the things with which you basically cite the source you do not just ignore it when we talk about the different methods of citation the way you basically cite the source so it includes uh, the footnotes which are there at the bottom of the page with an asterisk or some superscript number then you have the end notes where the notes of the reference is not there at the bottom on the contrary it comes at the end and all the details are placed at the end and talking about the parenthetical reference quite common quite simple and it's always used this is the one which is author's last name and then the page number so this is the, that's the way you basically give the reference and some of the styles that we talked about are the APA, the MLA, Oxford, Howard, and Chicago. And when we talk about the discussion, so we chose two and talk about uh, the MLA and the APA style. So when referring to the Modern Language Association style, Arts and Humanities, this is the domain where it's basically used. In case of the direct quotes, which are less than four lines, uh, you place them within the text whereas you use this block text format when there are more than four lines of course within quotation marks in both cases if there are some indirect quotes you are not taking direct quotes from the source whereas you have on the contrary you have found them in another source which becomes the secondary source so you first have to state directly the primary source and then you use parentheses to mention the secondary source and within the parenthesis you write qtd.in and then the secondary source name.
qtd.in refers to quoted in which means where was this primary source quoted in from which you have taken it so that's how you write it in case of three authors names are mentioned but in case of more than three you use at all which refers to and others this is the meaning of this expression for a book your way of writing is last name first name title of the book city colon publisher year informed this is the way for an article last name first name article title then volume the issue the year basically the issue is the year so you mention it then uh, page number database name if applicable the web detail uh, the day of access you have to mention it then you move ahead and we talked about the APA style quietly used and it's basically known as the author date citation system used in social sciences when it comes to writing a text in this uh, APA style you use Times New Roman whereas for uh, figures tables you use the Arial font for writing the content you basically double space it with an indented first line of each paragraph and another thing is that you align your text to the left hand margin I discussed in detail gave you a demo as well that when it comes to uh, the writing at the top the header within that header the very first header has the heading running head as well alongside you basically write your topic in a capitalized version but in the upcoming next every page at the top of the header you do not write these words are you double in ing and head running head you just write topic itself in a capitalized form but this running head word itself is placed in the very first page the topic page where you have to place it so this is the difference whereas the rest of it is all the same at the top left of the header running head and then the topic and on the right hand side I am referring to the right and left that I see in front of me in your case this is the right this is the left so if we move ahead in case of the multiple authors with separate years you mention each alongside the separate year I hope that this point is clear to you in case of this multiple authors who have written it with separate years you have to mention each alongside their separate years that's the way you refer to them then you move ahead and use signal phrases when you have to refer to something you simply say according to according to Amazon uh, I couldn't think of any name right that's why I have to say this word Amazon all the time but the purpose here is that you have to give the reference you basically signal it by the signal phrase and that is according to X according to Y according to Z there is one way another way is X stated that according to X or X was of the view that and then what was the view then you state it in case of two authors when you have to cite them or when you have to refer to them within the statement you simply write their name alongside this form of and that you see between name and name so this a and d form is basically written between name and name whereas when you have to write them within parenthesis at the end of the quote or the quotation then you use that other form that I talked about that is ampersand which is written in this eight form of a figure which you see so this uh, it is also written over here as well between name and main when it's written within the parenthesis so that's the way you write it for three to five uh, authors you first mention all and then use at all with the first name so in case of three to five in case of this APA format first of all you have to mention them but afterwards alongside the first one you can simply uh, skip or I would say cover them all by saying at all which means all others for six and more authors you just have to start with at all meaning first author and then at all in case of two authors with similar surnames both have the same name in that case you have to use their initial the first name initial for example if I have the name Anmol Ahmed I'm going to say A Ahmed 
So this A, the first A is by initial, first name initial, and that's the way if there is any other Ahmed who has written it in the same way. So if we have to mention both of them, so A Ahmed and N Ahmed. So in this way, you basically write them together. For a single author with multiple publication in a single year, so these are the uh, factors that you have to keep in mind. Here is the same multiple publication by a single author. So in that case, you have to differentiate them by using the letter A, B, C alongside the year number. For example, 2017 is the case 2017A, 2017B, 2017C. For reference page, you double space reference entries, you flush left the first line and then indent the subsequent lines. That's the way you basically provide the reference. You maintain enough alphabetical order, of course, by looking into uh, the last name, the last name starting with A and the rest of the letters of that name as well will be looked into in an alphabetical order in the same way. Invert the author's name first and then you look at which one should come first based on the alphabetical order. For a book, this is basically the reference. You have looked into it. For an encyclopedia and dictionary, this is basically the reference. You have seen it. For magazine and newspaper article, this is the format. For online periodical, this is the format. We discussed it. For online document, because it's an online document, you provide the URL as well. And then I talked about those tools, online tools for it as well. Now talking about the resume, we covered it as well. Resume is very much important. Document used to present your skills and abilities, like a personal advertisement, stating your professional credentials, prepared of course for an interview, a summary of what you are and what you can do. It's generally prepared in three formats. This chronological format is generally used, provides work history in reverse chronological order. A functional format is, uh, states the different types of skills when the work history is not directly related to the selected job. We discussed it. That, uh, then there is no need of this chronological format. You have done different things, you can mention them in a normal way. And if uh, they are related, and there are different skills, then you combine these above two to make a combination format, different types of skills, and written in a reverse chronological order. How do you structure it? It all begins with the identification. They want to know you first. So name, address, number, email address. Then you state the objective. You call it as the personal statement, where you simply state the desired job field, what can you contribute and how is it significant? You mention your skills, the relevant skills which are kind of related to what you really want to do. These are the things which you can mention, language proficiency, research. In your education, mention these degree institutions, specialization, honor, publication and projects. In your work experience, mention jobs, internship, volunteer work, all in uh, reverse order. In case of your interest, if they are relevant to the job, hobbies which suits you and your area of employment, mention it. In case of your reference, after their permission, you provide them in the form of an enclosure. It can be uh, all of these which have been mentioned below. With comparison, uh, in comparison to our CV, this resume is short because this curriculum we take provides an outline of person's educational and professional history. It can be a bit detailed. Another reason of its detail is that the faculty uh, really wants to see what you have done and what you really can contribute and education is a domain on the basis of which you basically build a nation. And that's the reason because of which it has to be very much clear, authentic, and you really need a strong foundation, a strong base to have a very strong building and for that purpose everything is looked into with quite detail and it has to be crystal clear. So prepared for faculty position, research position, for fellowships, grants and awards. Quite detailed compared with the resume, provides a summary of educational background, teaching, research, experience, publication, presentation, academic awards and honors and so on.
Resume and CV serve a similar purpose when we talk about such countries as mentioned over here. But in case of US, it's particularly used to apply for an academic, scientific and research position. So this difference should be there within your mind whenever you are applying either here or abroad in any other such area. So first make sure where you are applying, what are the norms, what are the conventions and then apply accordingly because that is going to uh, mark your success. CV has to be ordered in accordance with the job description. So talk about uh, what has to be included within a curriculum vitae, information, professional objective, educational background, scholarships and fellowships, research and scholarly activities which can cover your publication, your conference presentations, seminars, workshop, academic certification, professional membership if, they, if you have any, uh, your skills, the academic teaching experience, meaning what you have taught, what courses you have developed, what you have introduced, what uh, innovation you have done in teaching, academic and research interest and volunteer work if you have done any and at the end you provide the references. Had I told you, on the basis of the way you have developed this resume, the cover letter, the resume, the CV, you will be called for the interview. This is the time where you need some preparation, not just go there all of a sudden with shaking hands and thinking whether I'll be selected or I'll be rejected. This is the time when you need to do some preparation with some interview skills. What they are? The, basically, these are the skills which are going to simply make sure that you come up with your success at the end of this session with these skills. What basically an interview is? Enters from interaction view are all the perspectives. So interaction of views and perspectives. One-on-one -on -one conversation between you and your employer. An opportunity for the employer to see whether you really match with everything which you have stated and does your qualification really match with the skills which they need within the job. So there are different types of interviews you do the screening interview which are done in the form of these job fairs where they either select you or reject you, follow-up interview which leads towards the finals, phone interview in case you are at a distance, search committee interview when there is a panel and they really want to you know ask questions to see your skills and then if you move ahead there are some group interviews within which you are interviewed as a group to see how do you work together as a team to see your leadership and decision making then you are made to interact with people already working in an organization in the form of these breakfast lunch and dinner interview and then the final interview with the executive with the administration for your final selection so these are some of the types the style of an interview of course can be directive where they direct you what to answer it can be non-directive which may happen at the end when they say anything which you like to ask anything that you like to discuss Confrontational when they really want to see how do you react to a situation which may make you impatient and your behavior, the way you were given some situation and the way you reacted. So for an effective interview, what you require is some planning for self-assessment, understanding uh, your own interest, then the employer's information, then some awareness of the job for which you are applying, then doing this prior knowledge of the interview format and doing some mock interviews for going through this stage, for going through this process. Then preparing for the interview, which requires this, if it's your really first time, there are some pet questions. So you need to jot down the answers first, then practice saying them in front of the mirror, see how do you say them by filming and recording, and then get some feedback from a friend as well. Make a good first, uh, first impression with appearance, which means that dressing that we discussed in detail, your behavior should be very much positive, which means a firm handshake, a good eye contact, a good smiling face, a positive attitude, you know, reflecting sincerity and commitment with the organization with which you would really like to work. The nature of the interview questions were discussed as well. They are traditional questions more related with what's your experience, what's your background, what are your qualities, what you can do, what are your strengths and weaknesses. Behavioral questions are a bit interesting because they are used to predict your future behavior, the way you react uh, 
to a situation the previous situation which you have seen and the kind of situation you may face so how do you react for that they may ask you some question but to answer them what you require is this star and car formula which refers to the situation the task the action which you perform and the result and in case of car the context the action and the result the outcome of that action so that's the way you basically provide the answer they would really like to analyze interpersonal skills creativity your leadership your planning and your flexibility so for that star formula car formula turns out to be quite successful moving ahead there is another category of these technical questions which are all related to this field so if you know your field you will be able to answer them without any trouble at all because they will be more technical more scientific then there are some barriers to the effective communication even if i talk about the professional environment of which you become a part you're going to see some barriers and even the life from which you are passing even within this life within this phase you're facing such barriers you're not just aware of them so i just went through it alongside you with you we just went through this journey we looked into all these barriers so you are just a quick recap impediments which affect the whole communication process in what form can be a mechanical device troubling you can be some symbols with which you are not aware it can be the nature of the individual so on the basis of these types these are categorized into physical barriers semantic language barriers socio psychological barriers organizational barriers and cross cultural barriers now talking about them one by one physical barriers is the result of some defects in the medium environmental noise information overload so these are the reason as a result of which you face a physical barrier you talk about those language and semantic barriers so they can be the result of different meanings of word for example we discussed it we talked about it a fi financial charges and that charge is different from an electric charge so if you simply talk about uh, the word charge if you simply write it in front of an engineer it'll make him or her think it's an electric charge whereas the other person from the business field is going to take it to the financial charges so that's a different and the different meanings of words are going to develop different perceptions within your mind which can create a bit of confusion and act as a barrier in a similar way bank a river bank is there and a bank which is there next to your door from where you just go and take cash through your atm so these are the two banks as well words with same spelling different pronunciation and different meanings for example wind and wind wind up and the wind is blowing so same spelling different pronunciation as a result of which different meanings different position of the st stress which means if i say that uh, what do you like to present and right now this is present this is present tense so present and what do you like to present the stress itself is differentiating the two words confused in listening uh, not in written because their spelling simply uh, helps you to identify them but over here CITE site and SITE site both are pronounced the same way but in written they are really different misspelled words weak versus weak even sometimes while writing quickly we can do the error as well so this can cause a barrier too words with associative meaning for example home I talked about it I remember it within the lecture how do you perceive home home ground hometown home country or the home where you live where your bedroom is so that's the difference there are some technical terms which can act as a barrier as well and alongside placement of stress in a phrase like what do you think you are doing what do you think you are doing what do you think you are doing is basically the way the placement of stress in a phrase is changing the meaning Social and psychological barriers are basically like attention to points of our own interest. That's the way these barriers are developed. You only listen to something that is of your interest. You ignore everything else. Only accepting ideas which are of your own group. Accepting points which are strengthening your own self. Uh, you try to be more defensive. 
if there is anything which is harming your personality then if there is a difference of status between you and your interlocutor the other person who is listening or talking to you you're going to face this status block you may face it and that has to be dealt with as well then we are quite resistant to change we need to change that attitude as well uh, the narrow mindedness is also quite harmful it has to be avoided by this open mindedness and opening up Poor communication skills can be a bit troubling for you as well, so try to make yourself good with some strong communication skills. Then comes the organizational and professional barriers that you may face within the professional environment when the information is filtered by people. This filtering can simply result into the deletion of some important information which may be uh, considered something common by the people who are deleting it while forwarding it. The managers forwarding it to directors and the executives thinking that this is something already known so uh, and whereas if that's something new can simply be the cause of a big barrier which is faced within the communication then over dependence on the written communication everything is not supposed to be written sometimes you just have to directly state it for the to the other person for an effective meaning for an effective comprehension I believe and my own recommendation is that you can write it and alongside if you meet the other person that is going to have a big impact. It's going to make the meaning more better compared to just relying on the written communication. So use both and together this eclectic approach is going to make it more better in comprehension. Talking about uh, the intercultural barriers, barriers which are faced between cultures for example we talked about this case of language why of for example English when they say it uh, yes when used by the Americans means that they agree to the point whereas in case of Chinese so that means that they are listening expression of social relationship we talked about these cousins uncle aunt grandparents we have so many expressions but in case of for example talking about just English uncle and aunt we use them for almost every relation whereas in case of our Urdu language we have so many expressions we have so many relations to discriminate so another barrier we talked about the concept of time in a very interesting way the eastern concept of the circular circular nature of time whereas this linear nature of time in case of West this is just one example we looked into the way they consider it is so important the nature of time, the punctuality, the way it's taken within East and West, the nature of the space, the kind of space which should be there within two persons, being more uh, in case of West, whereas a bit less, they try to be, they try to be you know, close, e even in an interaction, in a professional communication as well, in case of the Eastern concept. So we're talking about the thought process, there is a contrast as well clear rational thought versus the emotional and the superstitious thought the use of gestures between east and west is also another difference the paralinguistic differences the interpretation of stress pause and differences the eastern silence versus the western verbosity they try to fill up this silence the west with some uh, words rather than the eastern concept that those who know do not speak and those who do not no, they simply speak. This is their thinking. So, just sharing for understanding, uh, no biasness, no prejudice, just for understanding and comprehension of all these points. Then talking about the perception, we just take snow as snow, whereas uh, Eskimos have different ways for the big snow, the medium snow, the small snow, uh, the falling snow, the static snow, they have so many names for it. So, it all uh, different we have different perceptions for it like we can think of you know uh, we have bread we can say roti we can say chapati but the thing is it's the same but uh, the way it's cooked the way it's prepared is we are giving it different names so the other person even the Englishman has to simply explain it first to understand what basically the perception is as the way I told you and interpreted and explained the different forms of the snow. So these are all the barriers that you face when it comes to intercultural barriers. 
Then we came at the end towards the punctuation, meaning the grammar, the basic grammar in case of the punctuation marks. Uh, it's all about the application of signs, spacing, and typographical devices for effective reading, interpretation, and comprehension. That's the purpose of these writing. To write as effectively as you speak. So you need some expressions which can signify the way you simply communicate within your paraverbal communication. So it performs a role similar to stress, intonation, rhythm, pauses, hand or body movement in case of speech. Then we talked about them. Period or full stop is used for, you know, declarative sentence to or to signify an acronym. So with an abbreviation, you place dots as well. For a question mark, you place it at the end of a question or to state something uncertain within parentheses. This question mark is there. To exclamate something, you place it. To express emotions, you simply place the explanation mark. Comma is interesting because as I told you, it's a substitute for and and or for separating and listing items to join two sentences alongside conjunction and to indicate that few redundant words have been left out. For that even, you place a comma. To insert additional information as well, you place a bracketing comma. You know, first comma, then the additional information, second comma. So the bracketing comma, why they act as a bracket. Semicolon, to separate equal parts of a sentence, to join together two closely related sentences together with a colon, semicolon, to separate two complete sentences when second sentence begins with a conjunctive adverb, for example, however and nevertheless, to separate items in a list already separated with commas. So you generally separate a list with commas, but if there is a list already separated with comma and you have to separate it further to give it some major division, then you use semicolon. For a colon, what follows is an explanation of what precedes. So the flow is from general to specific and for that you basically use colon and to introduce a list. Hyphen is for separating syllables of a word and also using compound word and for adjectival compound uh, which has a number as well. For example, 19th century novelist. So over here you're going to place this 19th dash century novelist. This is the way hyphen is used. Dash to indicate a break in thought to add parenthetical statements. Once again, dash statement dash. To add emphasis to indicate numerical range to link two connected words together. In case of parenthesis, you basically contain some extra information within them. You start off an interruption from the rest of the component. You enclose an acronym within these abbreviations and it's considered to be more formal than a dash. So uh, this parenthesis is more formal than a dash. And what's more formal than a parenthesis? Comma. So remember that bracketing comma. Do not forget it. That's the purpose, which is why these are being taught together in a sequence. Quotation marks, speech marks or inverted commas, how used to enclose the exact words. Single quotation marks are used when there are already double quotation marks and if there is a quote within quote, so this uh, quote, the second quote which is there within the major quote is going to be placed within single quotation marks. So first single quotation mark, then double quotation marks. So this is the way you write it. And they're also used for irony and sarcasm using square quotes and for referring to a word and phrase as well. So there is a word for which you want to talk about. For example, irony is a word for which you want to talk about. You're going to place it within quotation marks and then discuss it. Ellipses are the suspension marks, the omission marks to omit something in writing. So if you do not want to write it, three dots, that says it all. Apostrophe, to indicate a contraction is not is written as isn't a possession this is Ahmed's car so D apostrophe then S and car in case of uh, there is a plural for which workers write so these are workers write workers are plural this apostrophe will come uh, after the S of workers and then write this is the difference Run-on sentence, a very interesting concept that we studied. 
a sentence or a way of saying it is when two independent clauses are written adjacent to one another but not connected properly. So it becomes a non sentence. Another specific category of this is that when a comma is used to join two independent clauses within a run-on sentence, it is called as a comma splice. This is the particular category. Moving ahead, transitional expressions such as therefore may also precede a comma of a run-on sentence. In all these cases, these will be considered to be a run-on sentence. A run-on sentence can be corrected. Now we are talking and looking towards the different components of correcting it. A run-on sentence can be corrected using a period, meaning a full stop between two independent clauses, a semicolon. That's also another way. Then moving ahead, subordinating conjunction to change one independent clause to dependent clause. This is the third way that you have to out of those two independent clauses, you turn one into a dependent clause by placing this subordinate conjunction that such as because or due to because I love to play tennis I'm going to come tomorrow otherwise if it wasn't there I love to play tennis I will come tomorrow so I will come tomorrow because I love to play tennis so this subordinate conjunction has simply made one independent into a dependent clause so that is the difference Moving ahead, we talked about determiners, what they are, these are the words placed in front of a noun to clarify what the noun refers to. These are placed in front of a noun phrase and they were classified into the definite articles such as the indefinite articles such as a and an, demonstrative, this, that, these, possessive pronouns, my, your, his, her, quantifiers, a few, a little, numbers, one, ten, Distributive, all, both, and etc. These are the classification of determiners. With reference to the indefinite article, these are used for generalizing things. And in case of the definite article, it is used to specify things. When you are aware that your audience is also aware of the thing that you are going to talk about. So you specify it. So this the is basically used with family names, names with off phrase, for example, the statue of liberty so off phrase is there in yours that's why placing this the with it name of uh, rivers the nile river the arabian sea the indian ocean so the is coming alongside these things then talking about the verb tenses we talked about in detail used to indicate action occurrence and state of being refers to the placement of verb in time there are three major types as you have studied them past, present and future. So a quick view will settle it all. Present indefinite all about this action at the moment. Fu for future you have to uh, place this adverbial phrase as well that the train goes in few minutes. The train leaves at 10 minutes. So in this way the Ad adverbial phrase is also there with which you can refer to a future event as well but without it you won't be able to the sentence will be considered incorrect progressive or the continuous tense is the one in which there is a continuing nature of the action and once again for the future you have to place the adverbial phrase as well present perfect is something you are referring to an event that began in past and has just completed and you are placing it uh, for which you basically say has decided you place the verb has or have as well present perfect continuous action that begin in past and continues into the present as well so for that to show this nature of the continuous you say has been talking has been doing talking about past past once again you start with the indefinite action that occurred in past meaning it was occurring in past so that's the way you write it in case of the past progressive tense this is the action which is uh, which started in past and is ongoing was walking so that's the way you do it past perfect tense action that took place and were completed in past perfect is something which is complete action that began but is now complete and then 
past perfect progressive continuing action in past that began before another past action began or interrupted the first action so this is one is a bit tricky as well but it's quite simple over here the point here is that this past action which began ends and is interrupted by another action and that is something which you have to state within your sentence as well so this is uh, an action which started in past and still continues till an other action begins and interrupts the first one so that's the way you state it by had been running for this long hours till he reached the school so this is the way you have to end or interrupt it for referring to future once again the indefinite action that will occur after the act of speaking it speaking about the action future progressive continuing action that will occur in future perfect action that will be completed sometime in the future that will begin and will be completed so future perfect and continuing action that will be completed at some specified uh, time in the future so action that will begin in future that will continue in the future and that will end somewhere in future as well so beginning continuing and its ending everything is ensured within this future perfect continuous tense so that's how uh, these tenses are to be understood then there has to be an agreement we talked about these rules subject verb agreement uh, singular verb for a singular subject uh, plural verb for a plural subject so two singular subjects connected by or nor singular verb if they are connected by either or neither nor once again a singular verb then when I is one of the two subjects so it will be placed second and will be followed by am when a singular subject is connected by or nor to a plural subject plural uh, subject is placed last and use a plural verb alongside it singular and plural subjects are connected by either nor uh, either or neither nor put the plural subject last and use a plural verb use a plural verb with two or more subjects when they are connected by and so once again plural verbs two or more subjects which are there you're going to place and with it sometimes the subject is separated from the verb by words such as along with as well as you do not have to confuse you do not have to get confused with it just focus on the subject which precedes these expressions so Ali along with the others will be going with us so that's the way you're going to write it pronouns each everyone every one everybody anybody someone somebody are all singular and require singular verbs in case of words indicating portions use the verb in accordance with the noun being used in the off phrase so 50% of the pie has disappeared because I'm saying pie 50% of the pies have disappeared because there is a there is there are pies 50% of the pies with the expression the number singular verb with a number it's a plural verb with either and neither as subjects you use singular verb with expressions beginning with here and there uh, this subject will be preceded by the verb and the word will be used according to this subject which is following the word singular word with sums of money or periods of time so this is also quite clear with pronouns such as who that which you have to use the verb according to the noun preceding these pronouns so he's the guy who met me yesterday so guy who so met is basically coming according to the guy not guys collective nouns such as team and staff may either be singular or plural depending on their use in a sentence so it depends on uh, the way it has to be used the sense will be cleared by their use of the word team and staff then we look towards the last one we talked about the word order rules in detail this is the general word order which is subject verb and object it becomes a bit tricky in case of using the indirect objects direct objects place and time expression you have the subject then the verb then the indirect object direct place and time in case of subordinate 
You, that's the order in case of adverbs or frequency. Place these adverbs before the main verb. That's why they are there before the main verb. In case of adverb of uh, manner, they're placed after the direct object for an interrogative expression. The rest of the order remains the same, but the interrogative comes at the beginning. And then the key has stopped, which means that there is nothing more for me to simply say to you, but there is much more to say. But I believe I have said a lot. And this is basically uh, the last slide of the whole course of the report writing skills. It was a wonderful experience even for me as well, because I tell you with the depth of my heart that I have learned everything with you. There are so many things about which even I wasn't aware myself. Those small minor technicalities, you do not go into that much detail even while going through it. But just for you, just to make you perfect professionals, I went through all the details and all the team which is working alongside the whole office. So we all worked over it together and we have simply made it and designed it for you to simply make you successful professionals wherever you will go within your fields. And I, on behalf of everyone who has developed and who is working for your success, would like to wish you best of luck and congratulate you in advance because we may not get a chance to, you know, congratulate you when you enter into your practical life. But you can always meet us. You can always take all the guidance from us, the kind of help that you need. We are always there. We'll be trying our level best to help you, to guide you and to assist you in every possible way we can. But it was a wonderful experience that I had with you. The only thing that I um, simply would like to say to you after everything that I have said is that do remember me in your prayers. And the next thing is that this shouldn't end over here, but this knowledge should spread like a chain reaction. You sending it to few more people, they sending it to or teaching it to few other more people. And in this way, this chain reaction that basically is witnessed in a, you know, fusion reaction or a fusion reaction should continue for the benefit of humanity rather than deteriorating it. So with that, I would like to uh, end my lecture. It was wonderful. And uh, of course, I couldn't see you through this camera, but you were, were able to see me. And whenever you want to see me again, just play the lecture and I'll start talking once again. But everything came from the depth of my heart. It was wonderful teaching you all. I hope that and I believe that I was able to teach you in the best possible way. Uh, and if there is anything else that you would like to ask, you have the channel, you can reach me through your moderators. So I wish you best of luck and thank you. God bless you all. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you.